true. Okay, so let's take a look at whether or not VC over VD equals VB over VA. We have all reason to believe that this is, that this is the case, but let's prove that, okay? You know, we can relate VB, VA, VD, VC because of the fact that here you have an adiabatic process. Here also have an adiabatic process. For adiabatic process, we're familiar with the fact that P times V to the power gamma equals a constant. Okay, you have pressure volume. We're interested in volume, of course. So volume certainly is a, uh, you know, is, a is a variable that we are looking for. But the other thing is, don't forget, TH going from A to B is the same. And TC going from C to D is the same. So temperature is also something we have in mind. We don't want the pressure to be there, really, because the pressure varies at all points. So is it true? Is it possible for us to take that, replace that P with other variables like T and V? Well, of course we can, because we can always use the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT, right? So P equals nRT over V. It's proportional to T over V, okay? So P is some sort of constant times T over V. We plug it in here, we have a T, and then you divide it by V, so V becomes, you have V to the V of, uh, uh, with the power gamma minus one. So adiabatic process can equally be written as T times V to the power gamma minus one equals a constant for any adiabatic process. Okay, so now let us use that equation to link points B and C because they are on the same adiabatic line, right? So I have uh, T B, but well, T B is just T H, right? T H at V B to the power gamma minus one. That's got to equal to T C, which is just T C, really. V C gamma minus one. That's for B and C. They're on the same adiabatic line. Similarly, from D to A, let us take this equation to relate points D and A. Okay, so I have TD, TD is just TC, all right? TC, uh, VD to the power gamma minus one. That's gotta be equal to TA, TA is just TH, TH. VA gamma minus one. All right, what do we do now? See, we want a relation between, uh, for this quantity, VA, VB, VC, VD. And you have TH, TC, TC, TH. Can we do something? Yes, we can. What we can do is you can multiply everything together, you see? This side and that side together. You have TC, TH. You also have TC, TH. So the temperature really just cancels out when you, when you, when you, when you take these two, multiply these two equations together. You got VB to the power gamma. Actually, every, whatever left, everything to the power gamma is one now. Okay, so you got VB, VD to the power gamma minus one equals to, what do you have? VCVA, VCVA to the power gamma minus one, right? Okay, forget about the power gamma minus one because they're the same on the both sides. So VB times VD equals VC times VA. Okay, this equals that. Therefore, uh, VB, move that VA over, over VA, indeed, equals VC over VD, if you move that VD down. So this is correct, okay, this is correct. So going back to the previous page, VC over VD equals VB over VA. We just proved that. So these two natural log functions are the same, and just as we suspected, whatever is in that red box, it equals one, okay. So we now found the desired results. And that is the efficiency of the Carnot engine operating between T cold and T hot. E Carnot is equal to 1 minus T C over T H. And according to the second law of thermodynamics, this does not only work for a Carnot engine, because any reversible engine give you the same exact efficiency. So this is also equal to the river the the efficiency of any reversible engine operating between these two same temperatures. Okay, no other engine can have an efficiency greater than that if they operate between the same two temperatures. So you see, even though the second law of thermodynamics is a very quantitative law, very general, but uh, I'm sorry, very general, but qualitative, right? It doesn't say, oh, you know, the, something has to equal to whatever. It only tells you, oh, certain things are not possible, this is not possible, that is not possible. But from the logical discussion that we, that we had before uh, to this point, 
we have found something very, very quantitative. We found, based on the second law of thermodynamics, that the efficiency of any thermal engine operating between T cold and T hot cannot exceed this greatest possible value. And that is quite remarkable. As a matter of fact, this explains why a lot of schemes that we might think of using the first law of thermodynamics, uh, you know, to extract energy, whatever, they're in reality totally, you know, uh, infeasible because the efficiency would be terribly low, even though, you know, you are looking at, uh, you know, you're not looking at violation of the first law of thermodynamics. As a matter of fact, let me rewrite this a little bit, okay? You, you take Tc here, T cold here, I mean T hot here, Th minus Tc, that's delta T, see? That's delta T. So you see the efficiency drops to zero if delta T is zero. Okay, so you want a greater efficiency, what do you do? You want the temperature difference between the hot and cold reservoir to be large. Okay, let's look at an example of how this works. Suppose you look at a steam engine, okay? A steam engine, uh, you know, using steam to, uh, to, to, to expand and, and, and drive the turbine to do work, whatever. Okay, let's say the hot, the hot temperature is the is the boiling temperature of water that's that's uh, 100 degrees Celsius okay and the low temperature is say we use ice so it dumps heat back to ice so that the temperature T cold is zero degrees Celsius. of course we have to use a uh, Kelvin scale but delta T is the same okay delta T really is just uh, uh, 100 degree Kelvin or 100 degrees Celsius doesn't really matter hot temperature that is the temperature of the steam you have to use Kelvin now. It's 373 Kelvin. So for an engine operating between between cold water, ice cold water, and uh, the uh, the boiling temperature of water. Okay. E. The greatest possible value is equal to this, but of course in reality is less than. 100k over 373k. You look at that number, that in fact is less than 33%, less than one third. You're getting about 27% only. What does that tell you? It tells you that for every 100 joules of energy that you extract from high temperature source, okay, at the very best, only 27 joules are used to do work. And what happened to the other 73 joules? They're dumped to the low temperature source. Not because we want to do it, but because the second law of thermodynamics tells us you have to do that. Otherwise, you violate the second law of thermodynamics. Even at the greatest possible value, the efficiency is only about 27 percent. Only about a quarter of the energy that you that you extract from a high temperature source is used to do useful work. The, the other three quarters are really dumped. This, for an ideal case, a real life situation, the efficiency is considerably lower even that 27 percent. Okay, in a related topic, let's look at a nuclear power plant. I don't know whether you looked at some nuclear power plants uh, the one that's closest to Los Angeles is the one right next to Interstate 5 on the way from Los Angeles to San Diego. It's about 80 miles away from downtown LA. It's called uh, San Onofre's Nuclear Power Plant. It is built right next to the Pacific Ocean. And you can look at nuclear power plants all over the world and you'll find uh, something common. They're always built right next to the ocean or otherwise a major river. You have to have a large body of water right next to you. You wonder what is going on here. Why don't you build a new? Is it possible to build a nuclear power plant right next to uh, in the middle of a desert with no river running through it? The answer is no. You cannot do that. Why is that? Well, we have a good idea why this is this is going on now. The thing is, the nuclear power plant. What it does is that it uses nuclear energy to, to generate heat. Okay, once it has that heat. Then you use that heat to, you know, to produce steam or whatever other means. Use that heat to heat up some substance such as water, and use that water to, to as, as expands, 
uh, you can use that to, 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 to do work, you know, push the turbine, produce electricity, whatever. So essentially, the nuclear energy is used to generate heat. Once you have heat, then essentially this becomes the heat engine, okay? You take that heat and then you do work, and you dump the rest of the heat to the colder environment. Now, the second law tells us you cannot avoid dumping heat to the cold environment. Okay, you just want the heat dump to be as little as possible. You want to maximize W, you want to minimize QC. In other words, you want to maximize efficiency. The thing about efficiency is that the efficiency is less than 1 minus Tc over Th. Now, Th is the high temperature inside, and that has to do with how you design the nuclear uh, facility and if you use water for example you know it's around maybe 373 Kelvin when it when it boils right but TC what about that that is a cold temperature environment to which you dump the heat the excessive heat if you dump we have a large quantity of heat that you need to dump and if you dump it to a small pool of water okay a small pool of water guess what happens to the temperature it rises, right? So, unless you are dealing with very large body of water, such as the ocean or a major river, you the soon as soon as you dump a lot of heat to it, the temperature rises. When temperature rises, what happens? To efficiency, it goes down. So you see, it is not a good idea to dump heat to a limited amount of water because that will increase the temperature of the water, and then as a result, decrease the efficiency. So the best thing to do is to build it right next to the ocean or a major river so that no matter how much heat you dumped into it, the temperature of water locally doesn't really rise significantly. This is why we're doing this. Now let's take a look at a heat engine running backwards. This is known as either a refrigerator or a heat, or a heat pump depending on the uh, circumstances. You take a heat engine and run it backwards so that you extract heat from a cold temperature source, QC. Somebody has to input some work maybe through electrical means or whatever you plug into power outlet okay and then heat gets pumped to the high temperature source this could be inside a refrigerator this could be a kitchen okay uh if you work use it as a heat pump say for example in the winter time you want to pump some heat from outside the house to inside the house okay yeah you can do that you can uh, actually the, the heat that you get into the house is greater than the heat you extract from outside because QC plus W equals QH. You see, it's not QC equals QH. In fact, that is not possible according to the second law. You cannot just pump heat without doing anything else. You must take some work input. Okay, you have, you have to use, say, some electrical energy. Uh, for the refrigerator or the heat pump, we can define something similar to efficiency, but this time we don't call it efficiency. It's called a coefficient of performance, COP, coefficient of performance. And that depends on which mode it is. If it's in a refrigerator mode, and the idea is we want to extract heat as much as heat as much as possible extract heat as much as possible from inside the refrigerator right without using too much electricity without using too much work so the coefficient of performance for the refrigerator mode naturally is defined as qc over w you see that i want a large amount of heat extracted from inside the refrigerator without using too much w using too much work input now, as a heat pump, if you want to heat up your house quickly using a heat pump, what you want is that you want a lot of heat, right? You want a lot of heat to go into the house without using too much electricity, okay? So the coefficient of performance for the heat pump mode, that will be defined naturally as QH over W. Does that make sense? You don't care how much heat is extracted from outside, you know, you don't care. You just care about how much heat does the house get, okay? Once you plug in a power outlet, you consume this much electrical energy, how much heat do I get in return, okay? So you see, the coefficient of performance for a heat engine running backwards really depends on how you use it. Do you use a refrigerator or use it as a heat pump? All right, you know how, to, how you heat up your house in the, in, the, in, the, in the middle of the winter? If it's a small room, what you may do is you buy, you know, a little electrical heater, right? And what what this thing does is that, you know, you plug into power supply and uh, it just converts to electrical energy into thermal energy. Okay, the efficiency can be very close to 100%. But no matter how you do it, 
This thing will never get you more heat than the electrical electrical energy it consumes. Suppose it consumes 100, 100 joules of electrical energy. You can only get 100 joules worth of thermal energy to heat up your house, no more. But if you use a heat pump, things can be better because not only do you, see this is the, this is the electrical energy you consume, okay? But in addition to that, you also can pump some heat from outside the, 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 the room, which is the cold environment, and get T hot. So T hot can actually exceed W, which means maybe for every 100 joules of energy you use, you can actually get 150 joules of heat to heat up your house. So the heat pump has more, has, it works better than a conventional electrical heater in this sense.